I'm so glad that you could join us today. Um, since my retirement from active ministry in Uganda, I now have two SND jobs, and I love both of them. The first is one of the co-directors for our associate program. That's men and women who share the Notre Dame spirit and who we work with and share faith with so that we are able to, we hope, carry out the gospel in whatever way God leads us. And also, I am the coordinator for the JPIC, Justice, Peace, and Integrity of Creation, um, efforts for the Covington region. And so today, we have a marvelous core team of people who head up the uh, various initiatives that we as Sisters of Notre Dame have taken on. Um, you probably think of Sisters of Notre Dame as educators, or we run hospitals and orphanages. Um, so ministry on the margins might seem a little out of character or a little different, but really it's not. Um, SNDs do whatever's needed when it's needed. Once that was education, especially for poor children, especially women and girls, um, who wouldn't get an education if we didn't uh, work on that. So we did that and we've run the hospitals and the orphanages, but now wonderful people are doing that very effectively. And often those are the very people that we educated. So now we say, okay, so what is needed now? And I don't know if you know, but every six years, Sisters of Notre Dame hold what we call a general chapter. And that's all the sisters from 15 countries on five different continents who ask that question very seriously. So back in 2016, when we asked off that question, we definitely the justice initiatives for the people who are marginalized. And so after I attended a big meeting in Rome, I came back and this core team is what resulted. And the core team, along with roughly 80 sisters and almost 100 associates have been working on this ever since. And that's what we're sharing with you today. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to two of our associates who are going to talk about the environment, which is one of our key initiatives now. I'm Mary Ellen Millar, and this is Sharon Harris. We are associates of the Sisters of Notre Dame and members of the Justice, Peace and Integrity of Creation Committee. Our particular focus is on creation and the care for our common home. Greta Thunberg, the teenage Swedish climate activist stated, we must change almost everything in our current societies. The bigger your carbon footprint, the bigger your moral duty, the bigger your platform, the bigger your responsibility. Adults keep saying, oh, we can owe it to the young people to give them hope, but I don't want your hope. I don't want you to behave hate, hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I want you to act as you would in a crisis. And I want you to act as if your house is on fire because it is. Pope Francis in his encyclical Laudato Si says, the human environment and the natural environment deteriorate together. We cannot adequately combat environmental degradation unless we attend to the causes related to human and social degradation. In fact, the deterioration of the environment and of society affects the most vulnerable people on the planet. The impact of present imbalances is also seen in the premature death of many of the poor. Recently, Pope Francis launched a new Laudato Si platform and describes it as a seven year journey that will see our communities committed in different ways to becoming totally sustainable in the spirit of integral ecology. We are at a point in the history of our planet, our common home as Pope Francis has called it, where we need to recognize that what we do, what we eat, what we purchase and where we invest our money affects not only our home, but the people who live here. Care for the earth is the ultimate right to life issue. 
an old focus of environmental activism that has recently seen a surge in interest, <clears throat> excuse me, and activity is centered on environmental racism. Think about Flint, Michigan, and how for years they've battled a water crisis. The Natural Resources Defense Council, Council describes a time in the early 80s when contaminated soil in North Carolina was uh, planned to be moved to a community with a majority black population. We can go back further in history to a time when Cesar Chavez fought to protect migrant farm workers from harmful pesticides. Air pollution, wastewater, tainted drinking water, and landfills are disproportionately found in areas of poverty and with greater numbers of people of color. It has been shown that people living in poverty actually contribute much less to environmental degradation, and yet they pay the price because the areas in which they live are prime targets for industrial waste, pollution, and on and on. So what can we do about it? As members of JPIC, we believe information and communication are key. Broad global change is necessary, and sometimes thinking about that can be overwhelming. But what we can do in our private lives and in our communities is to fight against environmental injustices. Can we bring reusable bags to the grocery? Can we recycle? One easy thing we can do is we can stay informed. We can know the issues locally, nationally, and globally. We can take an inventory of how we live our lives and ask the hard question, does my life reflect my belief? All life is sacred. Pope Francis Laudato Si is a call to action. And there are many quotes from this amazing document. And when Pope Francis speaks of our common home, he includes the people from whom we share our planet, those we know and those that are on the other side of the globe. Environmental racism will become environmental justice if we recognize we are all connected in this life. Take some time to listen to the news. Just yesterday, I got my copy of the AARP magazine and the entire front cover is devoted to climate change. Hear about what's happening to our lakes, to our rivers, to our world. We are not living sustainably. Locally in Northern Kentucky and uh, the greater Cincinnati area, we have several organizations that um, are committed to working to protect our common home. Organizations such as Green Umbrella, the Banklick Watershed Council, Boone and Kenton Conservancies and the Kentucky Nature Preserves Commission. Every community has someone or some agency working to change how we view the world. Get involved. Thank you very much. And now please welcome JPIC members who will speak about immigration. Hello. My name is Sister Maria Francine and um, I'm part of the Immigration Committee. We um, get our impetus and our incentive for working with um, the um, Immigration Committee uh, from the quote from Matthew 25, which says, for I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Hebrew scripture likewise says, you shall also love the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. This is from Deuteronomy. Our guide for uh, justice for immigrants is taken straight from the um, USCCB. That's the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. The website is www.justiceforimmigrants.org. There are about myths about immigration. It would tell us the church's position on immigration, as well as um, telling us um, what we can do, practical guides, particularly for parishes. What touches us and what moves us to get into this um, immigration issue is the desperation that we see in the life of the immigrant. 
there are thousands um, of immigrants who are away from home. They have sacrificed everything. They've sacrificed sometimes much of their life in trying to come here. They've sacrificed their family, their language, their culture. So uh, we try and, and uh, give consolation and help to the immigrant. Now I'm gonna um, present some uh, slides. The first one is um, from uh, some of the times that we've met people at the bus. Um, so uh, there, um, there are people, immigrants, who begin um, from the south of our country and then go to, um, uh, to Cincinnati. And uh, Cincinnati is usually uh, one of the stops. People, when they take the bus, don't realize that it's going to take them a lot longer because uh, sometimes they have a lot of stops and delays. So we try and give them a nice meal as they pass through. Uh, here's, um, you can see um, some photos, but what I want to talk to you about is one man. He is a Honduran and uh, he is a father. He realized that his children eventually would be, uh, would encounter danger in, in the Honduras. Sure enough, uh, well, he, he taught them some English so that they would be prepared. Uh, when they were approaching their teenage years, a gang um, approached the, um, the young boy and invited him into the gang. Likewise, his daughter was desired by the gang. The father um, offered some resistance, and so uh, their home was burnt down. It was then that they fled. We also know that immigration is a life issue. Uh, we believe in all the life issues from conception into natural death. Um, to show how immigration is a life issue, I'm going to share the story of a friend, a sister of a friend of mine. Uh, she uh, saw her son. Uh, killed by a, a gang on her front lawn. Her other son had already been tortured and killed by a gang. At that point, she decided to leave Mexico. She came up here um, when she found out um, about um, the money for a visa, the wait for the visa, she became discouraged and she returned to Mexico. It was less than a month or two and she was killed as well. Immigration is a life issue. So uh, what can we as sisters and associates do? I've already mentioned that we meet the buses coming through. And this is well of welcoming people and particularly fulfilling their needs, um, that of food um, for the rest of their journey. We are also involved in education. Some of us have taught English, as you see sister in the picture. Uh, some of us have offered um, immigration workshops. We invited Iman to talk about his culture and describe the concept of a sanctuary city. You can also see that we write letters to support immigration. We have prayed together. We prepare for, um, we prepared a posada uh, so that other people could uh, enjoy the cultural um, prayer of the Mexicans before Christmas. And we usually have um, annually a prayer for um, migration week, which is in early January. Now I'm going to um, allow Jan uh, Ferguson to continue um, as she is also one of our uh, immigration members. In Fratelli Tutu, Pope Francis says, I realize that some people are hesitant and fearful with regard to migrants. I consider this part of our natural instinct for self-defense. Yet, it is also true that an individual and a people are only fruitful and productive if they're able to develop a creative openness to others. I ask everyone to move beyond the, those primal reactions because there is a problem when doubts and fears condition our way of thinking and acting to the point of making us intolerant, closed, and perhaps even without realizing it racist. In this way, fear deprives us of the desire and the ability to encounter the other in those we meet. Let, let us help each other to work towards the goal of becoming welcoming to our brothers and sisters and helping them along their path. I would like to end as we began with a return to scripture. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, we read, the angel of the Lord appeared to just Joseph in a dream and said, rise, 
take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Joseph rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. He stayed there until the death of Herod, that what the Lord had said through the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Let us see in each immigrant the holy family, for they too were called to leave their homeland due to danger. They traversed hundreds, if not thousands of miles to reach Egypt. And Mary and Joseph only did so to protect their son from danger. Please consider joining our immigrant immigration committee. We'd love to help you uh, learn more about issues and to work with us to help our brothers and sisters. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Jane Bratton and sister Mary Lynette. Thank you, Jan. My name is Jane Bratton, and I'm here with Sister Lynette to talk about human trafficking, which is also referred to as modern day slavery. Defined, it is the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of people through coercion, force, or fraud with the goal of exploiting these people for profit. The two types of human trafficking are forced labor and sex exploitation. There are between 20 and 40 million people enslaved today. Internationally, less than half of a percent of survivors are identified, while the vast majority of cases go undetected. Human traffickers earn global profits of roughly $150 billion a year, $99 billion of that coming from commercial sexual exploitation. It's estimated that around 50,000 people are trafficked into the U.S. each year, most often from Mexico and the Philippines. But we can't kid ourselves because it's also happening in our cities, in our counties and states, maybe even in our neighborhoods and our local schools. In 2018, more than half of the criminal human trafficking cases that were active in the U.S. were sex trafficking cases that involved only children. Globally, an estimated 71% of these slaves are women and girls. Every two and a half hours, a child is taken by human traffickers. Every trafficked child is purchased for sex more than five times a day. Once the child is enslaved, they live for around seven years. According to various reports, a large number of child sex trafficking survivors in the US were at one time in the foster care system. Advocates report that a growing number of traffickers are using online social media platforms to recruit their victims. The average age a child enters a sex trade in the U.S. is between 12 and 14, and many of these victims are runaway girls who have previously been sexually abused. In 2018, the National Human Trafficking Hotline received more calls from California than any other state in the US, followed by Texas and Florida. The patron saint of human trafficking is Josephine Paquita. She was born in 1869 in a small village in Sudan. When she was around seven years old, she was kidnapped and sold into slavery and tortured by several different owners. According to the Paquita Foundation, one of her owners cut her 114 times and then poured salt in her wounds to make sure that the scars were permanent. During his homily at her canonization mass in St. Peter's Square in 2000, St. John Paul II said that in St. Josephine Paquita, quote, we find a shining advocate 
of genuine emancipation. The history of her life inspires not passive acceptance, but the firm resolve to work effectively to free girls and women from oppression and violence and to return them to their dignity in the full exercise of their rights. St. Paquita's feast day is February 8th. And now I'd like to turn it over to Sister Lynette. I would just like to give you some information on some local agencies here in Northern Kentucky and the great, greater Cincinnati area, which is mostly Cincinnati and even in Indiana. The first one is Josephine's Clinic. It is located in Cincinnati and the clinic provides a holistic approach in helping those in human trafficking and in violence. They provide medical, forensic, mental health, and trauma-informed care. All of the care at the clinic is research-based. They offer education programs in the community, and they also provide internship and volunteer programs. This gives others to actively serve in activities that promote community resources, such as housing, food pantries, homeless shelters, medical and dental care, mental health counseling services, just to mention a few. This is the uh, website and um, phone number if anyone's interested. And this will all be on the website. So if you're interested in looking into this, they are just beginning to open up the agency again. Uh, during the pandemic, everything was locked down. So the women that were there, uh, they stayed there. And uh, so now people are able to come back in and volunteer and so forth. Another group that's located here in Northern Kentucky is the Women of Alabaster. This is a very faith-based group. Uh, they go out um, in the evenings to the women on the streets and try to offer them counseling. Um, they try to build a relationship with them in order to offer them a different way of life. And this is um, a volunteer program, but the, the women who volunteer in this program are trained and always go in pairs. And it is a very active group. They work also with the um, Josephine group in Cincinnati. So if they need all of these um, mental or any other kind of treatment, uh, they can get this. So it's a very well-established program. And they are also now just opening back up. So um, this will give people an opportunity to uh, work in this if they're interested. We do have a sister in our Toledo region who uh, does this as part of her ministry. And this is their address and phone number. The other week, I had an opportunity to um, see a presentation by the Still Point Theater Collection, and it was entitled Project Respect. This group is out of Chicago, and they travel throughout the United States uh, presenting actual stories of human trafficking. And they're very powerful. So if you ever have an opportunity to see this, uh, it would be very worthwhile. We also locally, and this is um, usually the program is presented in Newport, Kentucky, is the Tri-State Anti-Human Trafficking Network. And Judy Malone is in charge of that. And they have been through the summer and during the pandemic doing Zooms, but now they're going to start having uh, active meetings, which we did participate in that. And of course, the National Anti-Human Trafficking Hotline, that is the number, and that's sort of the most popular number uh, that most people use. And if you're interested in uh, hearing more about trafficking, there is a newsletter that comes out, it's Sisters Against Trafficking. And if you're interested, you can type that in and uh, you can pull that up and uh, see that. But that keeps you up to date on what's happening. 
and just another avenue of education, go to YouTube and type in human trafficking. It's unreal of all the things that come up. So what can we do? Well, I think the most important thing that we can do is pray. You know, pray for those enslaved and for the groups that are stepping up to help. Uh, it takes a special person to do that. So let's keep them in prayer. And then also, I think, educate yourself. You know, if you don't know, we gave you a lot of facts in the beginning, but there's so much more out there of individual um, people and their stories. And then if you get into uh, some of these organizations, they teach you how to look for things um, just to be on the, well, to what the word is, watch, you know, but you can see some of the different things that happen to people or people that try to uh, keep them out of your way. Uh, so those are things that, that are important. And then once you do have a little background to help educate others, um, it's fine just to know yourself, but you can also spread the word. And of course, financially, if you can help, everyone is always eager to get financial help. So thank you. And now I would like to turn it over to Sister Raynette. I'm, sis I'm Sister Raynette, and I'm a member of the JPIC committee. And um, we address social concerns, um, especially care for our brothers and sisters in need, and brothers and sisters in need. So that means I see a need, I try to take some action, and I address that need, uh, which will bring life to those, that group. I really have a passion and a concern for homeless people. And through experience and also through research, I discovered that besides the major need of the homeless, there are also things that are needed during the summer and the winter, and they're not the same. Winter is warmth and summer is thirst. So the blessing project I'm involved with provides for both of these. In the winter, with warmth being the issue, we collected blankets and afghans, and we filled these blankets and afghans with all kinds of things that would help during the winter. We put in warm, warm gloves, we put in scarves, we placed thick socks, you know, most of their feet are cold and wet and painful, so thick socks are a big uh, item that's needed. We put in lotions and salves and snacks. And in every packet, we put a $5 gift certificate to a fast food restaurant. They could at least get a cup of coffee uh, and a sandwich, a small sandwich. And then we put a, a little card in with it and says, courage and hope is our prayer for you. And we sign it from the Sisters of Notre Dame and the Associates. Then we wrap these items in a blanket and we share them with people who are homeless. And this is what one of the packages looked like. An insider tucked all those items. For the summer, well, for some years I lived in the city and I experienced often that the homeless people would come to our backyard, they would turn on the hose and they would just drink water from the hose. Or the other thing, they would just pour the hose water over their entire body. So I knew thirst was an issue that had to be addressed. So we decided to collect um, water bottles and we sanitized the water bottles. And for a couple years, we placed items in the water bottle uh, but now we know they don't all fit, but these are some of the things that we placed in the water bottle. We put um, powdered drink mix. We put a bottle of water. We put healthy snacks and maybe not so healthy snacks. We put um, tissues. We put toothbrushes and toothpaste in there. And for men, we put razors and beef jerky. They love their beef jerky. And for women, we put in tampons because that's an item which is very difficult to 
get. We also included the $5 gift card and uh, for a restaurant and the note that said courage and hope is our prayer for you. So we put it all in a bottle initially that was sanitized, but we found out that we had a lot more things. And so now we put it all in a bag and we passed out the bags. So where do we find these homes? I mean, where do we find the homeless people? Well, we can find them um, on the streets in Covington of Madison, Scott Street, and Newport. And we go up and down the streets, either in a car or walking and pass out the bags. If you look at any of the exits and entrances to the bridges or expressways, you always see people with signs, I'm homeless, I can use anything. Gathering places like the library um, is a place that we go and also a park, Rudolph Park in Covington. The other day we went under the bridge. They have now set up little places, the homeless people under the bridges and we uh, gave the water bottles to them. And we just discovered a new place which we'll have to investigate but it's down by the river and we saw some tents there. So we think that's gonna be a good place to go to pass out the water bottles. What are our needs? Well, donations of materials. We have plenty of water bottles, but we do need the other items. We need gift cards or financial help to purchase the gift cards. We need help in assembling the items and we need help in distributing the items. And you can help by dropping off any of these items at St. Joseph Heights, 1601 Dixie Highway, Covington, Kentucky, 41011, which will also be published on this web website. But please mark it Blessing Project. Or you can mail uh, to the same address, but put on the envelope Blessing Project. Most importantly, we need prayers for the success of the Blessing Project and for the continued hope and courage for our brothers and sisters in need. And now Sister Rita will conclude the presentation. Hopefully you are as impressed and excited about what you just heard as I and the other sisters and associates are. Much good work is being done, but there's still so much, much more to do and we need help in every way shape and form you don't need to be an associate but we'd certainly welcome you um, if you'd like to get more information about association please contact me and again on our website you have all the information that you need we'd love to have you join us um, there's never enough to take care of all of the people who are right around us and that's why we have our local blessings group as well as our major initiatives, which are also very local. But what's so exciting now is the fact that we are national as Sisters of Notre Dame and the same work, these same initiatives are taking place throughout the country. And that means that we've multiplied the good work. We need your time. We need your talent. We need your treasure. And can't maybe get out and do as much as we did. Everyday prayer and the offering of your diminishment in your older age is a gift that the church that we need. We are the body of Christ and everything we do in terms of prayer and sacrifice does make a difference somewhere, everywhere in the world. So please join us in that. But also if you can be a little more active, would be wonderful. I'm going to conclude with a quote from a sister Norma Pimentel, who started the Catholic Charities Respite Center here in um, uh, McAllen, Texas. Sister Maria and I are here for the month helping out, and oh my God, there is so much that can be done here. But Sister Norma said, it's time that we wake up, go and do something, be a voice to those things we see that are wrong and be a voice and act and help others who are close to me to do that as well. So talk it up. We all see the need 
Let's together decide what we can do. Sister Norma goes on to say, it's not okay to just complain. It's not okay to just be silent. It's not okay to just be afraid. We have to put all that aside and act. And that's what we're asking all of you who have joined us. And that's what we ask of ourselves. We need to do whatever we can. And together we make a huge difference. So those are the prepared remarks. Now we'd like to talk to you and answer any questions that you might have. can't um, be involved with people who um, Jesus has said, this is me, without growing in your faith in Jesus Christ and walking with Jesus Christ by walking with these people. So by accompanying others, um, I feel that it enriches um, my ability to, to really serve Christ and one another and to really see other people as our brothers and sisters. And it makes us united. And it all brings together the word that um, Sister Mary Rita said, we have a chapter, well, the upcoming chapter is encounter. And this whole thing is about encountering our brothers and sisters and finding Christ through them. So. As a, a lay person, um, it's hard to put your faith in action. Um, being part of the human trafficking committee, I have learned a lot. I've been blessed to be able to go to um, a conference in Cincinnati, various presentations. Um, and so I've, I've learned more about it, um, more about what to watch for, more about the signs. Um, I've actually been able to put it into practice at my job. So that was very rewarding, but it does make me, you know, and it's, it's like Sister Lynette said, if you watch any YouTube video about human trafficking, um, about the victims, but also about the, the ways that people are helping them. You know, that just kind of helps grow my faith because I know that I can do more um, in this, this and help them walk this journey as much as I can here in Northern Kentucky. I think Matthew 25 says, whatsoever you do to my brothers and sisters, you do to me. Um, and working with the homeless, yes, I give them a bottle or I give them a blanket, but they give me so much more because I found that the homeless love to talk and they will tell me their whole life story. And I just appreciate how they can continue to live the way they are living um, after that. I know uh, in the city, they, uh, they hit a, a small area that they hit tents and they, the city came in without telling them, uh, removed everything, the tents and all the personal belongings. And one man said, my daughter, I had one picture of my daughter and that was gone. Now people don't usually think about that, but that was heartbreaking for him. And there's so many other stories like that. So I think just coming in contact with those who are poor uh, has been a gift and a blessing for me. I think um, for me, I've always tried and very often fail to live minimally. Um, it wasn't until someone a few years ago pointed out that, you know, my $5 bargain t-shirt that um, I purchased that a, a, a lot more went into that than the $5 that I paid for it. And um, I started to realize the impact that my purchases were making on people globally. And so I've tried to be much more conscious of what I buy um, because I know now that it's not always about the convenience. It's not always about um, the price. It's about the people who are involved and the resources the people and the resources involved in um, preparing what it is that I'm desiring at this particular moment. Thanks. I think uh, what's been so important to me is, 
you know, nowadays, if you watch television or you talk to somebody, it's so easy to get overwhelmed by all of the things that are wrong in the country and they're huge problems. And I can't fix global warming and I can't fix a lot of these. However, when I was meeting the buses with the immigrants in Cincinnati, you know, I was giving little children that had nothing a stuffed toy or I was helping somebody get medical aid or just feeding them a hot meal. I knew that I was doing what God wanted me to do. I was helping one person at a time and that's all I could do, but it made me really feel good to do something active. I still can't change the big problems, but I can change those people I meet in my own world. I think if each person, no matter in what of these ministries that we're working in, that we take the opportunity to think, who are we meeting? Who are we seeing? Because we're seeing Christ in each one of these persons, the homeless, the women being trafficked, the children being trafficked, the immigrants that are being put on buses and sent all over. I think each one of us have an opportunity in different ways that we meet someone who maybe just needs a smile who just needs someone to listen to, but we should see Christ in them. And I think that for me has really been um, a focus. You know, when you go and you see people like on the street and you know, they're not dressed very well, they might be dirty um, because they don't have an opportunity to get a shower. But if you just smile at them, you'd be surprised how they smile back and usually have something to say. And I just think for me, that has always been important. And, and I know when I lived in the city, uh, it was something that I walked each day and we had or had so many friends just by seeing these same people day in and day out. And it, it just always, always just brought Christ. You could just see Christ in them. So for me, that's, that's the important thing. And we can only do any of this one person at a time. Like Jan said, we can't change the whole world. We're not meant to change the whole world, but we are the body of Christ. We are made in God's image. We talk about the value of life and we all believe in that. Everyone has a right to a life. And I wish that we could share the goodness that we experience from one another as sisters and associates and people of this area, we are so blessed and we can, we are sharing day to day. And I especially say to the people who are suffering, who people who have arthritis, let's say, or can't get around like you used to, and you need a walker now and you feel your whole body diminishing, that is for something. God uses those aches and pains and that suffering to change and give people what they need to live in one of these migrant shelters. It is unbelievable to withstand the torture of human trafficking, to be in a place where there isn't enough water. And I know what I am Uganda where they could change very noticeable to those farmers. No, we can not in the world, but where we are, we can make a difference because we are Christ in the world today. We carry on the good that Jesus did when he was the face of the earth. And that's so, and that's why creation has always been the CERN of the sister, and we've just done it in different ways at different times in history. But the time is now, and the needs are obvious.